I just knew from a, a very early stage, if we were going to sell enough shows to, to really make an impact on the industry, which is the goal, you can't do that without almost supernatural level of optimism. And so I think at the beginning, I probably was faking the optimism for a very long time until it became part of my actual personality. This is Global Vid, a podcast about the TV and streaming business with host Eric Lapointe. If you enjoy learning with us, subscribe here or on your favorite app. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Global Vid. This is season three, and I am here once again with a guest that was a part of our season two, Mr. Dave Knoll. How are you? I'm awesome. So good to see you. I'm really excited about season three. Season two is gangbusters. Unbelievable. That season finale, the cliffhanger, unbelievable. Season three, I can't even imagine. I don't know if I really had a cliffhanger, <laughs> Dave, but thanks for saying that nonetheless. Whoever is listening or watching, season two was amazing. Season one obviously was legendary. Season two was where it's at. Uh, you got to go back and, and watch all of that. Awesome. And we're going to get straight into the thick of things because, Dave, just as a quick intro, you are uh, one of the creators behind great, successful shows, Chopped and America Says. But if people want to hear more about your background, more about what you do, there is another episode we did last year. So I'll, I'll, I'll provide a link for that as well. So that, if people are curious, you'll, you'll learn more about Dave Noel right there. But we're going to get straight into it because you are currently fine tuning your book, The Visionary in Charge, which is going to be launched sometime in this year in 2023. And uh, it's really interesting. Now, you provided me one chapter as a teaser, which is great, <laughs> because it's perfect for this episode, because we're going to talk about development and how hard development is, and what kind of mindset you have to have. Your chapter was, there is no fear and there is no failure. But before we start talking about that mindset and why, what does that mean exactly? Let's start talking about the ugly side of development, what everybody calls development hell. <laughs> and There's no uh, ugly side. It's all uh, oh, no. roses and daffodils. And, of course, uh... of course, it's all roses and daffodils. But in reality, it's time consuming. Quite frankly, it can be a blow to the ego because you know you're you're getting rejected time and time again. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, a hundred percent. So let's start with that. Let's talk about some of your nightmare stories. When I meet with college students, which I I do as much of as I can, uh, classes or Zoom classes or whatever, oftentimes someone will say, "Oh my gosh, you have the best job ever." You know, you're creating game shows for a living. You're creating cooking competitions, uh, dating shows. You have the greatest job ever. It is tons of fun. And yes, 100%, I admit it. There are times where I'm on this floor right here drawing things and, and, and using my colorful Sharpies to create what I think a new game board would look like. I watched, you know, a day of television sometimes watching the same show, the same, even the same episode of the same show over and over and over again, taking notes to see exactly how that format breaks down. Whatever that successful show is, whether it's an episode of Shark Tank or Married at First Sight or America's Got Talent or what, or a classic episode of Family Feud or something like that. There are days that are, absolutely tons of fun. It is a hundred percent the greatest job ever, but it is also, you know, when, when people talk about development hell, it's extremely difficult to succeed. It, it is, it is very, very hard because there are so many companies and there's so many show ideas and you need to pitch these buyers, people, you need to know what they're looking for. You need to know what not only that person is looking for, but the whole, the buyer, the whole network, what they're looking for. You need to pitch them the right show on the right day to the right person at the right time. And that almost never happens. I like to say a hit TV show isn't just a miracle. That's what I used to say. Any hit TV show is a miracle. It is not. Any hit TV show is at least three miracles. There's at least three. Mm -hmm. 
and more most likely there's four or five there's it's got to be a series of miracles a series of things that happens that just amazing and you think back how did that possibly happen before those miracles let's talk about some of those nightmare stories uh, <laughs> that you've had and you and you and that you reference in your in your book the visionary in charge well, the classic, I guess, is Chopped because people who know the show know that right about now it's about to cross the thousandth episode. Mm -hmm. And yet after we developed it forever, after we made a pilot, after we poured our blood and sweat into that show, there was a moment where it was killed. Basically, what happened was we pitched the show almost identical to what it is now. We pitched a show with four chefs down to three, down to two, down to one winner. We pitched a show where it was appetizer, main course, dessert. We even pitched like the, how we saw the tone, the colors, almost all of it was in that original document, in that original pitch. But in the development process, Food Network, their major hit competition at that point in time, they had only ever had one and it was Iron Chef. And there's a moment in Iron Chef that is a bit of a story. It isn't just a studio. They're in Kitchen Stadium. And there's a, there's a story that happens right at the beginning of the show. So the development executives at Food Network kept saying, this show, Chopped, is very simple. And, and it is now. There, you know, there is really no story in the final version. But they said, can we add a bit of story to it? Can we add a bit more story? So the very simple premise of four chefs down to three, down to two, down to one, cooking these three courses and getting eliminated one by one turned into, in the first pilot, they were cooking for a billionaire at a mansion and a, bi a billionaire that you never saw. And the, the host, the Ted Allen character, was the butler and he was giving these assignments to these guest chefs that were coming. And it was exactly the same format beats, but it had this kind of fantastical story element to it. And people call it the dog pilot because when chefs were eliminated, the butler would feed their chopped dish to the dog, the billionaire's dog. Almost embarrassing to say at this point, or as Cleve, my partner who creates all the shows with me, she's like, that also could be genius now. We should bring that back. <laughs> but, you know, when a show like that gets killed, you have really spent a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you have really talked yourself into, this is going to be potentially amazing. This, this is going to work. We have figured it out. They've given us all these notes and we've cracked this code. And, and then they killed it almost instantly I don't even think they watched the whole thing. I think mm -hmm. the the higher ups took one look at that tape and was like, this isn't the food network. We're, yeah. we're killing it. So that's a great example when we look at something that did eventually get on air and clearly had some momentum because a year and four months is not too long. So a couple months later, the showrunner, Linda Lee, was in my office and she said, Dave, we have to go back in there. We have to go back in there. Mm. And at that point, if you if you can imagine, they've paid for this pilot, they've given us notes, they've we've listened to them, they've given us more notes, we've listened to them, they've given us edit notes, we've listened to them, and then they turned it down cold. So if you're going back in, it is basically saying, we disagree with your development team. You have to come up with a creative way of saying that. Right, okay. And, and also, they, it could make everyone very angry, right? the logical response to you going back in is them saying, you failed. We gave you this money for this pilot. You failed. And yet we, Linda is a very, very, I mean, first of all, a wonderful person and incredibly talented and very smart and very creative, but also a very, very strong Southern woman and a woman who I listened to when she talks. And so she said, we have to go back in there. And I was like, do you, I, I totally agree. But do you really think they're going to listen to us? And she was basically just like, I think we have to go back in. It's like a Hail Mary. Yeah. And I, and that's exact. I basically took it as a Hail Mary. And I was like, you know what? I think you're totally right. But we, we have to go back into the, we have to go to the top. And Bob Tushman at that point was the top 
of the chain at Food Network. And we were able to get this meeting with Bob Tushman and Allison Page, who worked with him at that point, and their whole development team. And it was, I had in my hand a manila folder with the original pitch in it. And what we were going to say is, look, we really feel like this original pitch was amazing and it could be enormous on the Food Network and it could last for you know, many years, many seasons. We had this whole speech prepared and we get in and there's all these people in the room and I'm about to say, and she's about to say, you just passed on this pilot. We totally disagree with you. And amazingly, because I was starting to sweat, amazingly, Bob Tushman reached over and he had also the same document I had in my folder. He had the original pitch and miraculously, amazingly, he said, guys, I don't get this. This pitch is so good. Why isn't this the show that was delivered? Because we were advised the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I changed everything because you don't want to insult the development team, like whatever. You don't know what they were hearing and there's so much internal stuff that happened. Sure, yeah. So we very carefully said, that's the show we definitely, that's the pilot we wanted to do. It's the pilot we want to do. The development process took us down this storytelling road and and your team was part of that process the whole time. They asked us to do these things and we did them. And to his credit, he said, let's do a second pilot. I think he would be thrilled. Everyone at the Food Network is thrilled that he did that. Allison Page is certainly thrilled. And obviously we're thrilled. There's a lesson there that's really important because what I'm also hearing that is it's not good to be so headstrong to go against the development team, you're going to get canned way more quickly. Yes. But you are at a point now where like, well, it's do or die. You read these stories again and again and again, these majorly successful projects, Stranger Things, Cheers, like there's all these really big, gigantic shows or movies, but, and, and our two biggest hits of all time at one point we had a pilot that was killed and we were able to bring it back. And really the, the takeaway we have learned is to never, ever, ever give up on a project you really feel could be enormously successful. If you really feel that way, figure out another way in. And, and so I don't mean be headstrong and yell at people and because that's not going to work either. Yeah. What I do mean is figure out another way. Uh, Jerry Weintraub, who he produced all the Karate Kid movies, all the Ocean's Eleven movies, and was uh, Frank Sinatra's manager and Elvis's manager and all these people. And just this amazing guy. He wrote a book uh, and I have met him a number of times. He would just always say so much of his success, speaking in baseball metaphors, is that he was just the last person on the field. Everyone else had given up. Like you take the loss, you take the out, you're it's pain, you it's embarrassing, you fail, you fail, you fail. And he's like, after everyone else has left the field, often you have success. Yep. That's one of the ways I look at it is if there's something we really believe passionately in, how do we repitch it, retitle it, recreate it, represent it? Is there someone new we could talk to? There's got to be a way, especially when you have something like Chopped, where I was convinced I, in the pitch, I said, this could be your jeopardy. This could be on the air constantly. We could make, I, I think I was so bold. And I said, we could make, you know, 100, 200 episodes. And Charles Norlander, you know, definitely laughed at me. He was like, you're crazy. <laughs> he was the person who took the pitch. What I was trying to say was this could be a gigantic hit. Yeah. If If we bring it back to what, it was supposed to be in the first place. Now, I also want to talk about some of the shows that have never aired because oh so those stories are interesting too. And, you know, in, Heartbreakers. in that chapter, you talk about at one point, there's one executive that reaches out to you and says, hey, we love your shows. We want to get all these pitches. And then you got ghosted. And another example, despite all your experience, you still have to deal with the same stuff that everybody else does. And, and you wrote, you know, you, you got just slammed and insulted. It happens fairly frequently that people will pass in an insulting way. This isn't at all what we're looking for. This is completely off the mark, things like that. But also you have to know every day that that's, 
there is a lot of money at stake, right? Mm -hmm. Like television is a lot about failure. It is a lot about whichever executive this is, whichever network this is, is putting a number of things on the air and often they don't work. So they're wasting giant sums of money. So you have to constantly keep in mind that that is TV, that is show business. That is what we're dealing with every day. Yes, there was an example, and this has happened a couple of times over the years where an executive reached out. In this case, he reached out and was very complimentary and was like, you guys are so unbelievable. We're looking for a lot of product right now. Gave us very, very specific notes. And we, we do what we always do. Cleve and I get extremely excited often whether it's ideas we have and we give them to each other or whether it's a network executive reaching out and saying, here's exactly what we're looking for. You know, have been working together for 15 years. So we go through everything we've ever created, thousands of ideas. What do we have in here that's the perfect thing for this buyer at this moment in time? And so this, this particular example, we had very specific notes what always happens is I come up with say eight to 10 projects, maybe on a good weekend, it's 12. Mm -hmm. Usually it's like eight and I'm ready. And they're all like well-crafted. I'm a person who thinks about every little angle of each show and every segment in an annoyingly detailed way. Mm -hmm. And Cleve, as I say, is much more like a popcorn popper. She's a fireworks display of amazing creative. Like that's just literally who she is. She's unbelievable. So he gave us these notes, say on a Thursday or a Wednesday, we both talked about them. What about this? What about this? What about this? Then we went our separate directions over the weekend. Then we talked about it again, Monday or Tuesday. I said, here's the ideas that I have. And I sent them to her in an email, you know, with the title and here's the, ta the, the way it would change and dig it, dig it. She sends me her email with 25 things, 32 things on it. She's unbelievable. And each thing, a lot of them are new. It's amazing what she does. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. So then you submit your best so work. Then the two of us get together and we spend hours deciding on what the six are. In this case, it was six. And then I was like, okay, I'll take the six and I'll craft them into the perfect document. This is, the document that proves everything he's looking for. It's the, there's gotta be there, six gold bars. There's gotta be one in here that you just absolutely love. You can't resist. And so I worked on that. Cleve gave me notes. I worked on it more. We perfected it. Then we sent it in and he literally never got back. You know, then you're left with the age old, like, well, what do I do now? Do that I is in some ways so worse. <laughs> and it, and maybe even unprofessional i don't it's, know it's uh, well i don't want to put you in that spot i'm the one saying that so actually you're not you're not saying that i'm saying that <laughs> it is what it is and you and the other thing that you kind of have to in order to keep walking tall every day the other thing you have to kind of remember mm -hmm. is there's a lot that goes on in tv so people might be busy it could just be that somebody's boss got fired it could be that another project started and that's where their focus is. There's so many things that can happen that derail people. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you do to talk yourself into that. It's not terrible. This is a perfect transition to talking about the mindset you need because you're, you're essentially bringing it up yourself. And I'm, I'm just going to have one more thing though. Once your book comes out, I highly recommend for people to get this because there's another brilliant story about you and Howie Mandel. Let's leave that as a cliffhanger. We'll let people read about it once they pick up the book. So let, let's switch to the mindset. What kind of mindset do you need so that you can say, like the chapter does, there is no fear and there is no failure? Super easy to say, Dave, but how do you do that? At the beginning, when you're starting off, you're pitching your, your soul every single time with the perfect title and the perfect tagline and you're doing all these things and the perfect documents or the perfect sizzle tape that you've worked on forever. And then it's getting turned down again and again and again and again. And you think, oh, maybe I'm terrible at this. Like maybe I'm awful. Like I sold this one thing, this development deal, but maybe this is just going to be nothing but failure. And the, the mindset has to be, there is no fear 
in this game and there is no failure. And what I mean by that is very early on, a couple of years in to creating and selling TV shows, I started weirdly, as I think back, like a like a crazy person obsessing over, is there a an equation, a mathematical equation we could come up with that would basically say, how many times would you have to pitch to get to a smash hit television show? So what would be the average? And I figured, well, there must be an average. So the first thing we did was uh, Brandon Tartikoff wrote this book. And in his book, he says, even the best show, even the greatest show of all time, just picture that you're going to have to pitch it 30 times before anyone buys it. But that's only for the next level of a development deal. Just, just to, just to take it to beyond a piece of paper or whatever. And he said, it's just because look, what you don't know is what time slot do they have? Maybe they don't have the right headspace for that show right now. Maybe the person's in a bad mood. Maybe they don't have any money and they're not telling you, oh, we don't have any money right now to buy new stuff. There's so many reasons people turn things down that have nothing to do with your show. So he said, you're going to have to pitch 30 times. So I wrote that number on the board. It was 30 was the first number we were looking for. Then I went to other production companies. This is right when we were starting off. And I said, of every deal that you get, how many deals do you need for one to go to series? And at this point, you know, we had had a couple deals, but I went to these other production companies and I went to a couple of network executives and said, of every deal, how many actually get through and make it to series? And basically the answer was one out of four. And so that's 30 times four. Okay, so you need to pitch 30 times four. Now I was like, okay, of everything that gets on air, how many actually becomes a hit? How many gets to season three was the number in my head. Yeah. Uh, a lot of shows get a season two for strange reasons. It's very hard to get to season three, four, five. The average answer was eight. And so I had on our board 30 times four times eight equals 960. I don't think I'm messing up the math. Maybe I am. Well, they can pick up the book if they want to see the full equation. Exactly. And that helped us so much because every time we got turned down, I just thought, well, that's one more step on the way to 960. Now, every every pitch has to be great in that equation. You can't pitch a dud. You can't pitch something that everyone rolls their eyes at. It has to be great pitches. Right. And Chopped was right around pitch 860 or something, 870. And so we kept a log of all the pitches. So we kind of beat the odds. <laughs> you're a numbers guy because you're keeping a log of all the rejections, which is a little bit like Stephen King did. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah. And it was, we, we did uh, for years and we still do years and years and years and years of here's everything we've ever pitched. And then a quick note on why it got turned down and whatever. And it's all taking more steps towards what's that big giant hit. What's the, you know, in, un in the unscripted world, what's the next wheel of fortune? What's the next America's got talent, the next shark tank, the next chopped. When I first uh, had you on the show, it changed a lot how I looked at development moving forward, I have to say. And what inspired me was like this, this relentless optimism, which I don't think we need to talk about it in this episode because people could just go back to the old one to, to see that. And so the other actual tip that really hit the mark for me when I read this chapter was to look at this entire game of development as a chessboard. And some pieces get knocked down as you move forward because it's a game, but you keep advancing all the way to the end. It's just the way I started looking at it ages ago. And maybe it's because we work on game shows or maybe it's just because of the, the way my brain works. But uh, I started picturing it as a gigantic, gorgeous chessboard with this bright blue sky with some billowy clouds. <laughs> and what we're doing are creating these, what we think of as these gorgeous, elaborate, you know, 10 foot tall chess pieces. And every day we have to figure out how to move the chess piece one step forward. And that literally is how I look at it. Right above me right now is a board with these squares and each square has a, a title on it. 
those are shows. So in this metaphor, this this image that I have, these chess pieces, whether it's chopped or America says or whatever it is, I look at those squares every day and I'm like, what can I do? Is there an email I can send? Is there a way I can rewrite the deck? Is there a way I can rewrite the tagline? Is there, is there someone I haven't reached out to yet? Is there a partner we can add? What can I do to move this chess piece a little bit forward today or this week? So you're constantly adjusting the shows as you get this feedback coming in. At every single day, because what you want is to get to the end of that chessboard and you want the phone call or the email where they say, hey, congratulations, we want to take this to the, we want to do a pilot. We want to go straight to series, which happens every once in a while. We want to, we want to take this to the next level. And then once you do that, say you get a series and they call and they say, we're going to give you 10 episodes or we're going to give you 65 episodes or whatever it is. Now you are just simply moving up a level. See, that shows that you're a game show creator because you're just <laughs> taking the game of chess and you've gamified it into almost like a video game. But now yeah. you're just going to level two. <laughs> and it is even when, you know, what when people say, well, what's your job? Like a show like America Says, what's your job once there's been 40 episodes? Now you have all these people who know what they're doing. You don't need me anymore. Well, my job is to take it to the next level. America Says isn't as big as Family Feud or Wheel of Fortune. That's the goal. It's The goal is that there's Australia Says and France Says and Canada Says. And until that moment, my job's not done. So America Says is one of those squares up there. What can I do today to push that forward, to push Chopped forward so there's more than a thousand episodes, so there's more success to make it even bigger? And that's really the whole job every single day. And yes, it's everyone else's job to knock the pieces down. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's it's a comp well, it's a competition. I have gotten the one executive who we were working with said, for years I thought your optimism was fake. Like I thought you were just faking it every single day. And I think really there's two answers to that. One is it is fake. I get, you know, I do get frustrated and it's just me and Cleve who know that, or me and my wife, I guess, where I'm just like, ah, oh, those bastards, you know, or whatever it is. But the other thing is I probably was faking it at the beginning, right? Like at the beginning, it was Julia Roberts who said she was, she found herself so successful so quickly. And she found herself in all these big giant meetings where big decisions were being made. And she started freaking out, literally, which so many people in show business do. There's all this money at play. And you just, if, especially if you're young, she was so young. And so one day she just realized, she was like, Julia, you're an actress. Act like you belong in this room. And and she's like, it helped me so much. And so it's the classic fake it till you make it. She, sure. Julia Roberts acted like an intelligent actress. I just knew from... A, a very early stage, if we were going to sell enough shows to to really make an impact on the industry, which is the goal, you can't do that without almost supernatural level of optimism. And so I think at the beginning, I probably was faking the optimism for a very long time until it became part of my actual personality. And, you know, no fear, no failure doesn't mean that there aren't some hard days and, and and difficult blows but at the same time it's putting yourself in that mindset just like young Stephen King and I yep. think your chess example is the something that perhaps should be copied by everybody listening because <laughs> honestly that is the way to go beyond fake it or make it but I'm also playing a game and I have to be strategic about it and I have to keep going until the end so I can get up to level two. And I imagine maybe even level three. And it pushes you to take action. And I think I, I that's not why I did it at first. I just kind of imagined it. I, I don't know. But what business executives have said to me, as I've said, they've heard about this chess thing and they've asked me about it. What I keep hearing from very successful CEOs, business world, is what you're doing simply is imagining this thing where every push is action. And, and every time you're pushing, you're saying, what's the smartest action on behalf of this show can I take today? 
that is that is what it is. And what we have to do, because it's our chosen profession, is create these crazy shows every day and figure out a way to take the best ones and do anything you can to get them on the air. Just whatever the case may be, get the darn thing on the air. So I know your book has even more tips on you know, positive ways and techniques to keep that mindset, because it's one thing to have it, but then how do you do it? So I, I invite everyone to check that out. I'll provide a link in the description uh, once the book is out or available for pre-order. So check in on that. And if anybody buys it from me, it'll also help contribute to uh, to this podcast as well. And definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the big one, but also Instagram and Facebook. Any of these tips that I have, I have put on LinkedIn already. So that if you go through all my old LinkedIn posts, it's essentially the same thing as reading the book. Buy the book, obviously. And what you should really be doing is buying five copies of the book. I challenge everyone. <laughs> as a human being, I, I heartily think five copies is the way to go. Okay. Well, if they love it, then they'll want to spread it <laughs> uh, with other people. But just before we conclude this episode, what's uh, what's next for you in 2023? 2023 is the same thing. <laughs> other than, well, I mean, other than the book, like what it's are the you? Same thing, except there's a book coming out. But other than that, there's a there's a book coming out, and that's amazing, and it's shocking, and I'm I can't believe I finished it, and I can't believe it's coming out. But uh, other than that, it's creating new shows every day, and that kind of endless quest. We have deals right now for new game shows. We have deals right now for a new cooking competition a new uh, big giant reality competition series, a dating uh, relationship series. It's just trying to get that next giant hit on the air. So the next time I talk to you, you can be like, wow, your new show really took off and it became a major success all around the world. Well, I wish that for you, Dave. And thanks a lot for sharing all your knowledge with us uh, today uh, on this topic of development hell, but spinning it around and saying let's there is no fear and there is no failure thank you so much thank you this has been the global vid podcast thanks to my guest dave knoll plus our show editor nicole almeida and theme song composers amber goodwin and aaron ross to support this show please subscribe and see the episode description for more details thanks for listening <laughs>